Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the Prince Podcast here on Podcast Juice. My name is Michael Dean, and of course, my co-host today is Mr. Big Sexy and Saxer. How are you? Oh man, I'm doing well. Rough week in court. Almost had to get into it at trial, but at the last hour, your man pulled it out, got the thing resolved. All right, there we go. That's what we love to hear. And today we have another special guest. Man, this gentleman goes all the way back. Old school Prince, the original manager of Prince. And he has a new book out. The uh, book is called Famous People Who've Met Me. And the author like is it. Mr. Owen Husney. Sir, how are you doing, Owen? I'm doing really well today. How are you guys doing? Having a, having a lot of fun. Yeah, I seen you. Uh, you're definitely out there, uh, you know, beating the uh, digital streets, as I like to say, uh, doing the interviews and, and, and you know, yeah, you, you know, you have to. It's uh, I'll be going out on tour, I guess, as uh, uh, as it were, uh, and, and doing various readings and going around the country. But this is the initial uh, digital push. You're right, and uh, boy, it's pretty intense. <laughs> and I'll tell you what's really interesting is I'm, you know, I'm an artist manager. I've been, you know, I was for 38 years. I was an artist manager and I've always represented other people, you know, mm -hmm. and now I'm representing myself <laughs> because of the book and going out and promoting the book. And it's really funny. I noticed that, you know, when my artist, uh, we would design the album cover, they were always tearing their hair out because they, nothing was right with the album cover. I was always trying to convince them, okay, look, this is the look, this is where we're going. You know, <laughs> now I find myself in the same place, you know, when we did the first book cover, I was like, no, I was tearing my hair out. And then I thought, oh, no, I see what everybody was talking about, all <laughs> right. those artists, you know, because <laughs> it's, you know, it's yourself. You're right. putting yourself out there. It's like, and I'm used to being behind the scenes, uh, just in terms of making things happen for my artists. So I don't know if it's like the old lawyer saying, you know, of someone who has himself for a client is a fool or has a fool for a client, <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, we're definitely out there beating the bushes, that's for sure. All right. Well, uh, I will say I definitely had a chance to read the book, and I thank you for sending me this book. Oh, you uh, did? Yeah, I, did, I definitely yeah. read it. Um, and, I, and I'm a reader, so and I'm also a reader of bios, particularly entertainment and music. So I was, and of course, I'm a Prince fan, so I was just ready to dive into this. And, and I will say this, and I'm going to say this to all the Prince fans listening there's been a lot of Prince books out and I say, go get them all because it helps you get a clearer picture when you put them all together. Um, but the interesting thing about this book is you start off as you should, you, you're talking about your experience and, and things that, you know, sort yeah. of made, got you to be the person that you are. And I really wanted to ask you um, about this because it's at the beginning of the book. And it's just one of those things I think that happens to us as kids that we forget that there are there are moments in our life that happen when we are children that can affect us to the day we die and, and sort of you know oh, help yeah. guide us. And you talk about I wanted to have you talk about it was the summer of 1956 is what you call the chapter. And I actually went back and, oh. and researched this online because I was like, well, I've never heard about this. But can you give us just a, what, I, you know, I want to take away from the true? book. <laughs> Say it again. Was it true? Was it true? It, oh, definitely it was. <laughs> yes. I mean, it's a tragic thing, man. It's, it's one of those things like, God, I don't know if I, I would be affected by this too, but can you just tell the listeners a little bit about what that was? Yeah. And let me, can I back up just for a sec Certainly. on that? On yeah. that? Because I, I, it was very strategic in my life. Um, I was always going to write a book at some point, you know, when, when things quieted down for me and, uh, there were a lot of people that thought that maybe, you know, I've seen it in articles that, you know, that my life began and ended with the, with the artist print, which is to, you know, which is not true. But what I really wanted to point out in the book is everything that led up to my meeting prints and all the experiences so that when we did bump into each other, 
uh, I had all this wealth of experience to know what to do and, and how to handle him. So now back to, you know, that, that story of the plane crash, there were defining moments in my life that helped shape me. And without going into too much detail, cause you can read about it. It's much better when you read about it than when I explain it. But, um, there had been a plane crash when I was a little boy in Minneapolis over near the airport on the South side of Minneapolis. And I had been, and what had happened was a, a Navy jet took off from the airport and one of the planes crashed into a neighborhood on a hot August day, which meant that many, many children were playing outside cause it was, you know, school was out and, uh, Many children were either, you know, injured badly or killed. And it was just, it was just a horrible experience. And I th- the first thing, and the reason I write about it is because, first of all, I was glued to my television set when it happened because it was really the first time that tragedies were, were being brought into your home by a TV and, mm-hmm. you know, everything else. And then I identified with those children because I had been outside too that day until bulletins started coming in. And it, I mean, it was just really a tragic uh, event. And the long and the short of the story is, is that, well, I identified it could have been me. And so my first experience as a child of, you know, that could have, that could be me. And then, Secondly, when my dad came home from work, I mean, everybody was buzzing. This was big news in Minneapolis, and obviously, and it was tragic news. And, but what people did back then, which I would never do, but it was pretty commonplace. A, I think because of the lack of media bringing things into your home, mm-hmm. if there was a, it's, it's like the, it's like when you drive by an auto accident and everybody slows down to look at the damage, you know, and, and so uh, um, the bottom line to all that is the, the more extended version of that, because there was no CNN or whatever have you, is that people got in their cars and drove over to the site of the tragedy. And <clears throat> so at any rate, my dad comes home and we're all excited uh, to, uh, to go over there. My dad says, let's drive over after dinner. Oh, great. Everybody was excited, you know, <laughs> funny, but it, it true. And so as we began to drive over near the crash site, I started to identify very heavily with the children. Suddenly I didn't want to be there. I did not want to be looky Lou and thousands of people literally drove and were parking on people's lawns to see this. The moral of the story is, is that I realized, Oh, then we get to the crash site. I'll just complete this. We get to the crash site and it comes time for my parents and my sister to get out and walk right up to the place about two blocks away. And I refused to get out of the car. I just refused to get out of that car. And because suddenly it hit me. What am I doing viewing the tragedy of others? And by the way, can I swear? Oh, yeah, yeah, God? of course. <laughs> Let it rip. <laughs> Why do I want to go look at this shit? You know, but it, re- it was exciting when we left the house, you know, to go, hey, let's go over there. And then when I get there, it's like, oh, God, then I don't want to get out of the car. Sorry, it's in the 50s. You know, people left children in cars, I guess. Your doors were unlocked in your neighborhood in Minneapolis, you know. So they said that they were going to go get out of the car and go look at it. I refused to go. I realized that I was starting to define myself as a person of, of people unable to, you know, people not, I don't want them to tell me what to do. Mm. I got kind of a little fight with my parents, but I'm a young kid, but my dad says, okay, you can stay in the car. Uh, Windows up, locks down. But, and they, they said, we'll be back in five minutes. Now, you know, they did come back in five minutes, but that five minutes was the lo- I'm sitting in that car all alone. I could see the smoke and the flames just over the treetops and you could definitely smell the jet fuel and all of that. And I began to sink with that. And I go into it in the book. There was a song that came on the radio that mm-hmm. saved my life, but it also made an indelible 
blueprint in in my life. I didn't know it, but as a mus- as a future musician, uh, it was going into my brain and would not come out. Uh, and at that same time, as a kid, I just said, "Hey, no, screw it. Nobody's going to tell me what to do." Mm. Uh, I had to have a few more of those experiences in my life. So it, it, it taught me that people are not going to force me to do something. I'd rather sit in the car alone as a young kid, scared to death that maybe the dead kids were going to come up and you know, ask me to come out and play or something. <laughs> and, and then the song comes on the radio. It's a very hot, So I'm pressing the buttons just to, you know, have something to do. And in those days, by the way, you could turn on your car radio and press those buttons that you didn't have to have the key in the ignition. <laughs> so the whole marriage of the smell of that accident and the jet fuel and the burning homes and everything else. And then the song coming on the radio, uh, I didn't know it, but uh, it was my beginning. So I could not get that song out of my brain. Okay. Mm-hmm. Until, um, I could not get that song out of my brain until uh, for six months later, till I had worked out every part in, of that song. And I list what the song is. The song, the, the story does have a kind of a very interesting it, en- ending that takes place about 40 years later. With, I don't with, give- yeah. I, don't, I won't give it away, but that was very interesting when I, when I was like, Whoa, you see how things sort of come around, but but I wanted to, I wanted you to tell that story because I think there's two things that you just outlined. One, it gives you that sort of mindset where you say, you know, I don't want people to tell me what to do. And then secondly, music, you understand, you know, that that force of music, that emotion of music, whether it's, you know, reminds the power. you. Of, there you go. It reminds you of a very fearful time, but you understand, like, well, this is a very powerful thing that I can feel with music yeah. and I can identify with any type of feeling with these music, but it's very powerful. So and I think those are things that kind of, when I look at the career you sort of outline in the book, I can, mm-hmm. it makes a lot of sense. I'm like, okay. And I see how you, <laughs> you interact with some of these iconic uh, superstars like Sly and Janice and different things, but I can see the part of somebody's not going to tell you what to do. You, you can stand up to these people and, and be who you need to be to them. Uh, but understand, whoa, this is an, I, you know, this, this musician is amazing. Like, and then you see them in the flesh perform and different things. Um, and I wanted to bring that right. too, because you have, I mean, there's so many other people besides Prince and we're going to get to Prince, trust me, uh, that are in this book that I was just like, okay, I didn't know. I didn't know. Uh, Owen got down like that. I never heard these stories. Cause I just, see? you know, I would yeah. see your name mentioned in things, but I mean, you, um, there's a with Al Jarreau. Look, I'll, I'll just tell you this Go ahead. as a preamble to all of this. Yeah. You know, in, in in you know, my parents are from the Middle East. Nobody ever knows it because my dad is dark skin, my mother is dark skin, my sister is dark skin. I come out blonde hair and blue eyes. Go figure. <laughs> you know, uh, and I was kind of the you know first American born uh, uh, son who kind of. I went the other way from everybody in the family. Everybody was, aren't you going to open a retail store? Hell no, I'm not going to open up a retail store, you know? And, uh, I kind of was the kid in my family who chose to go the opposite route of the typical route, you know, Mm. uh, with all due respect to accountants, uh, you know, I was not going to become what they wanted me to become. So I, I was fighting that all the time that helped define me as being completely different. And then, as you know, I, from reading the book, I was also bullied unmercifully right. in, in, uh, uh, in, in school. So, but overcoming these, overcoming all of these kinds of, of things and daring to let my passion rule my body, which was music and daring to do that in a family that had no understanding of, of, you know, what rock and roll was or soul music or anything, which I was into it. So, but all of that really helped define me. And by the way, it also helped define me when I became a father, because Mm. I made a vow that, you know, whatever my kids were into, as long as it wasn't dealing drugs or murdering people, that I would guide them 
I would never try to get them to do anything else. If they wanted to be a, a janitor, that was fine. You were just going to be a good janitor, a great janitor. You know what I mean? Okay. Yeah. And because every job has meaning. And it, whatever you're going to do, I was going to help guide them into it. So uh, lesson now, I probably have been talking so much that I forgot your original question. So I admit, <laughs> was there an original all, question? It's that? all good. It's all good. Let, let me, uh, let's shift a little bit because I know people, some people, ah, Prince. And this is Prince, this very young man, right, that you meet originally. This is not the superstar Prince. Uh, this may not be the overly confident uh, prince that I am so used to seeing, right? Just the guy that's like, man, this, you know, super confident and you know doing his thing. But you meet a a, a young prince. Can you describe yeah, I mean, that first time you actually met him? You don't have to go super detailed, but you know, just to give the listeners a little something of what you observed well, let's time, of this guy. Let's time- yeah, let's time travel for a little bit. Okay. Let's go back in time. Let's go back to 1976, mm. uh, probably around October when, you know, when I first met Prince. And when Chris Moon, who, believe me, I, I give every bit of credit to, uh, when he, you know, sort of uh, brought me the, the demo tape that they were working on. But mm. let's go back in time for a minute, because I found out another thing as I'm doing these radio interviews and podcasts and everything that people have a tendency to picture the iconic prince where, Mm -hmm. you know, where he was in 85 and 95 and 2005. So let's, let's time travel. Let's go back to that moment that I met him and let's picture a a young teenager who just turned 18. And now let's get that vision because sometimes it's hard for people to say, well, you know, he came along and, you know, he was an icon when you met him. No, he was a young kid. He was vulnerable, uh, hungry at, for any kind of knowledge and, and, and brilliant. But I will tell you something, very confident. And that's what I okay. liked about him is that he was, we- he was really well defined. I don't even know if he knew it or he knew where that confidence came from. Uh, I'm sure he knew he was talented, even at that young age. I'm sure that he had that ability uh, to kind of understand, hey, maybe I got some, something else going on versus the average guy that I'm hanging around with playing the guitar. Andre was a great compliment for him, and I think they were equals. But I think you know, beyond that, he did have a confidence that okay. actually instilled confidence in me. Mm. Uh, I like the fact that he was, he did know what he wanted and what he didn't want very, very early. Uh, but he was young. He didn't know anything about the business. And I always tell everybody, there's two words to show business, damn it. Get that in your head. You know, it's not show art. It's not show friends. It's show business. And you need to really understand the business part of it, too. And so, you know, obviously very naive in that part of it. Very naive. Uh, Andre uh, Simone came over for dinner the other night. We were just talking about that. And even there was a point where Andre was telling me that, uh, he said, you know, even when Prince was on the verge of signing a management contract with you, he was just still wondering, is this the right thing to do? And I guess there were some other people on the other side that wanted to sign him that were a little nefarious for any better word. Hmm. And Prince was, he knew what he had to do. And, uh, but Andre said in the end, and actually Andre said, man, you know what the truth is. You got to go with Owen because the other way is not going to lead you to anything positive. And it, but he was see, he was questioning. So if we separate the creativity and the musician versus the person who's young and probably doesn't know, you have to, you have to split that in two. What I noticed observationally was that he was highly articulate, highly intelligent, highly intuitive, and of course, brilliantly talented. 
And even that first day that he came over to my house, my house was filled with instruments at the time because I was in the music business and I was a musician. And he would just pick up something. He could just sit down and play the piano. It's like, whoa, where did that come from? <laughs> I think he did know how talented he was. I don't, he, obviously he didn't know how to take that, connect the dots from point A to point B to get a record deal to point C to do this. Mm. Uh, and I, and I said this before that if Prince would have been the kind of dude that would have come over to my house that first time laid down on my couch, turned down the ball game and rolled up a big fat joint, I probably would never have ever thought to manage him, but I could see the fire and you're either born with this. You're not, you're either born with extreme talent or you're not. If I went down my parents' basement and which I did learning guitar, got in a band, had a little hit record myself. But if I went down my basement for 150 years and then appeared one day and practiced, 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 practiced in my basement, never came out of the basement, I, 150 years later, I wouldn't have one 100,000th of the talent that Prince had. So you're either born with it or you're not. And what I saw from Prince was he kind of needed to work with me uh, because I knew the role. It, it, and it, I, I, I'm very careful in all interviews or anything that I wrote to never make it a brag piece. It wasn't like, you know, Hey man, I taught, then I taught Prince how to write this. And I told him how to do this and I, because first of all, I don't like when people do that, but secondly, because Prince really discovered himself, you know, mm. it was just, I, but we were, it was very 50, 50 once we signed the management agreement. It was very 50, 50. It was me, you know, uh, okay, I want to do a press kit. Okay. I got to get you in the studio. And he was very, very willing to accept what I had to say. He knew it was right. He trusted me. Um, but I would never have done any of that without knowing and understanding his intellect and knowing and understanding his, you know, his fire. Mm -hmm. You have to have passion and drive to make it in the business. If you have all the passion in the world, you know, I, it really takes talent, passion, and drive. You well, have it, to have three. It, it must have, it had to also take some money because, uh, you know, you talk in the book of, you know, listen, we had to raise some money, get this money together to get some of these things popping, like getting the artwork, getting the studio thing. So, I mean, and I thought that was interesting where, yeah, you can have the talent and all that, but it still takes tangible resources to execute That's correct. some of these things. And and that was very interesting that, you know, if you can just sort of expound, expound on that just a little bit to, you know, to say, Hey, you had to get these other people to believe in Prince to, so you can get this money together so we can get this thing popping. Yeah. And it took, it took a little while because obviously he was living in Andre's basement at that time. And by the way, a very good home experience for him. Uh, so lucky that he landed up over at Andre's house with Andre and his mom. Um, but he was in a basement, you know. So I at first, you know, I talk about this in the book a little bit. At first, I was like, okay, I, this is so easy. I'll just take the Chris Moon demos and I'll play them for people. And naturally, they're going to hear and see what I see it here and and they're going to open up their pocketbooks and you got to remember, put yourself back in Minneapolis, Minnesota at that time, you know? Uh, so I'm going to all these wealthy dudes and I'm saying, Hey God, this guy's great. And they're saying, wait a minute, you want me to take my money out of my bank account and trust you for this kid living in a basement who's never really done anything before. <laughs> and he's living over North. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And they're like, sorry, go talk to somebody else. And I got very deflated by that. So I wound up begging money out of, uh, out of people. And I had a lawyer that was uh, kind of working with me in the background at the time. And I went over and begged him. I said, I, I, we got to do this. This has to be done. Or I could lose prints because, you know, some money bags was going to come along at some point. And and so I literally got down on my hands and knees and begged this guy for, uh, to help me raise some money. And he did. He went to two other people, a doctor and a lawyer, and we raised a whole bunch of money. Mm. 
and I learned a, a really good lesson because, well, I'll, I'll come back to that, but we raised a whole bunch of money and then I strategically laid out the plan of what we, what needed to be done from getting him into his own living experience to getting him the instruments that he needed. Uh, you know, when I first met Prince and again, let's travel back in time, you know, the clothes, interesting, the clothes he had were definitely not the clothes of a wealthy man. Trust me on that one, you know, jeans and jean jacket and stuff. But what I noticed when he came over the first time is that, he knew about an ironing board because this shit was clean. <laughs> I mean, it might have been this shit yes, might have been sir. just jeans. You know what I'm saying? And it might have been, uh, you know, so he had his creases some going on. You sweater. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. What? <laughs> he had the creases going on in the yeah. pants. Yeah, the man, I'm telling you. You know, <laughs> I show up. Everything's all round on my legs and stuff. You know, because I don't know how to iron and. and <laughs> And he showed up, but he had put it these, these clothes together. He had spent some time thinking about this, oh, yeah. you know, had the, just coming over to my house. So uh, it was very interesting to see how conscious he was. And he was, even until we started to get the money to be able to help him get some clothes and, 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 and do all that. Uh, everything that he wore was, even though it was, probably from, I don't know, Target or, you know, whatever it was up at the Walgreens, he had put it together in a way that made sense. I don't know. I don't know if that makes any sense. No, I I mean, I noticed it right away. So all of these little, see, I wasn't looking for the big stuff at that time. I was looking for the little, the, the little hints. Does this guy have a sense of humor? Yes, he did. Is he a brilliant guy? Whoa. Yes, he was. Uh, what did he seem directed and focused? Yeah. So all of, for a manager, it doesn't make my job easier because I still got to get my head pounded into a wall, but it certainly allowed me to believe in him and trust him. And that's all on him. That ain't on me. I'm just there to lead you down the path. You, you, you know what I'm saying? Mm. So, uh, when we did get the money, we were able to, uh, then increase, his ability a, a little bit. It's just about opening doors and allowing people to have opportunity. Um, and, and that's, you know, that's, I saw that as my main job. I saw my main job as really not as Mr. Manager because he was very young, at, but I was, I considered myself Mr. Protector, put the right, give him the right tool, give him the opportunity, uh, get some funding for him. And allow him to be who he's going to be. You know, we didn't try to change him. I never said, hey, man, you should be looking like that young Michael Jackson. You know, let's get a suit on you and get a three-piece going. No, it had to be who, who he really was. And so then I could just take that and blow that up of who he really was. And that's what the money gave us. And, you know, I started after the first time I met him. I started writing him personal checks, just say, Hey man, do you need 50 bucks here? Do you need it? Because he didn't have any money and it, it, here's 50 bucks here. But I talk about it in the book. It was really embarrassing because here I was going over to Andre's house to see what, what this famous basement looked like. And I wrote, I had had a check for a hundred dollars in my pocket that I was proudly going to present to Prince after I, I wanted to see where they were living. And, so I drove over north, and we, I met uh, Andre's mom, Bernadette, who, wow, <laughs> wish she would have been my mom. She was terrific. Wow. And, uh, and then at the end, I see the little basement they're living in, and then I saw what a great friendship that Andre and Prince had. They were soul brothers. That sounds funny to use that expression, but they were. And, and then at the end, we're standing outside. It's starting to get cold in Minneapolis, and I'm kind of shaking, and I proudly pull this $100 check out, and I said, here, man, I want you to have this. You're going to need to you know, start taking care of yourself. And he looks at me, and he says, that's great, Owen, but I don't have a bank account. And I thought, how naive am I? You know, <laughs> <laughs> you know where this kid, he's living in a base. What would you think? He had a bank account over at, uh, you know, uh, Wells Fargo with 50000 in it and then just going to go cash the check? No. So then I realized, oh, man, 
I got to go open a bank account. So mm. we got a bank account for him so that I could start. And this was before I even signed the management contract. What, what, because, what? Oh, go ahead. I'm and sorry. that's about him. That's not about me. For sure. <laughs> I, I wanted to ask you this, and, and I think you did say this in the book, but I just wanted to ask, hear you say it. Like how, when you went to that house, the Anderson house there, and this to be clear, uh, because you, you framed the north side, what do you call it going, what did you say a couple of times, going north? Over north. Over north. Over north. That's now, what we called. It. Okay. And what did that, to the listeners, so, what, did that, what did the north side mean? Like, you know, when you hear that. Okay, so the so Over North was very lenient about who they sold and rented to. So <laughs> when uh, post war, when all the Jewish people were were needing a place to live, who had been kicked out of their countries, you know, by the Nazis or whatever, you know, and World War Two. So post World War Two, the Jews all moved over to the North Side, and. I think it happens a lot in a lot of cities. And then the Jews go through their thing. So like over North used to be almost 80% uh, Jews, probably post-war Jews that had fled mm -hmm. their country, mm -hmm. but it was very lenient over there. And there were great houses, houses just like, you know, and I'll tell you a funny story about that. That's not in the book, but, uh, and then as time goes on, the Jews, Jewish people uh, migrated over to other cities like St. Louis Park or other suburbs. Um, that's where I was born. And uh, as you, sometimes it follows, a lot of people who don't have a lot of money, um, perhaps people of color, move into the neighborhood. But the neighborhood was still very lenient about renting and selling. So like I knew the people who lived in Andre and Prince's house before they lived there. Okay. So that's just a little bit of the history of the city. So predominantly black area of Minneapolis, there was over North and there was over South and over North was where Prince and them all lived. And, you know, uh, I think Morris, I think Jimmy and Terry were more South side. I could be wrong. We can check that out. Uh, and, but, uh, Prince's cousin Chaz, uh, Andre, obviously, they're all living over north. So this was a so black black that, area, essentially, at this point. It was predominantly yeah, it was. black. Okay. It was. So that's why I'm going to go back to a question. But it's and funny so, because I knew everybody that lived in the houses before. Previous. Me. That's interesting. Oh, Andre was telling me who lived in his house uh, that allowed his mother to buy that house. And I knew that, mm. you know, that family. Wow. So it, 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 it's kind of you know, I moved into St. Louis Park. Now, here's the funny story. One day, Prince and I are driving around, and I grew up very poor, you know, probably a 900-square-foot home. And Prince says, you want to see where I lived with my, my mom? And, you know, uh, I drive, he drive, we go over north, drive up there. His house is nine times the size of my house. I'm going, man, whoa, look, <laughs> here are these over North stories, man. Your house is nine times the size of my house. What's the, what gives you? you know, it was like, it was a funny, it, it was a funny moment at, at that point, but uh, still, a, still a great area still exists. It, it, what I, and then going back to the question was like, I was curious, like how did they receive you coming you knocking on that door like who, who's this white man i mean was there was they like who is this i think guy? you're yeah i think who's this well, well you know and i heard some yelling going on before i anybody answered the door and i thought oh shit i'm getting out of here you know <laughs> <laughs> what's going on <laughs> i was about to bolt over to my car uh, not really but you know that was the feeling because i heard oh man this could be danger what am i doing here you know and then the door opens and it's Andre and, and I'm going, damn, he's good looking too. Was somebody cooked on this up? But is his mom cooking these people up in the basement? Is there a lab down there turning out beautiful, gorgeous, talented guys? You know, what's going on? Uh, and then Andre's mom came to the door and she said something like, um, Hey, sorry about the yelling. These kids got to keep their place clean. They've got to do the dishes and they got to get their homework done. Mm -hmm. And when I saw Andre's mother, Bernadette, I felt like I was home. Mm. This is a woman who she was cool. And she, I wanted her as my mom, you know? <laughs> and, 
And uh, I could see that she was helping these kids. She was giving them a home. They had, they had to do stuff to earn their keep there. And, uh, you know, I became pretty friendly with her after that, but I give her a lot of credit. So that was, and I wanted to see the famous basement, you know, that they had been telling me about. I think I remember a story. I can't remember if it's true or not that, you know, Andre was down there too. And uh, there was something he told me, or I read someplace where they drew a line and chalk down the middle of the floor to separate their quote unquote bedrooms, you know, Mm -hmm. (laughs) Uh, But I did notice how tight Andre and Prince were and how much they were sort of the yin and yang of each other. And uh, uh, it was, listen, for a guy like me, when I drove away from that house, it was like, God, I want to even work harder to do this. I really want to get this done. That's, uh, man, I I, I know we have... uh Time is precious, so I'm going to jump ahead here, and, and but I will implore people to get this book. I mean, we're not going to cover the book here. You got to read that for yourself. But the, another important part to me I was interested in was, and there's a picture of it in this book, you get Prince signed to Warner Brothers. Uh, you get that, there's the, you have the check, actually, the advance check in the book. I'm just cu- yeah. curious. The half of it. That was half of it. Half of it, Yes. What was that? Was there a point where uh, I don't know if you presented that to Prince or at least showed him? You guys were like, "Yo, from a guy who's coming from the 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 meager sort of background financially you described to now, he knows he's got all of this money or at least access to this." I was curious, what was his reaction to that? You know, he didn't jump up and down and go, "Whoopee!" You know, (laughs) "Let's go to Vegas." You know, he was like. Let's get to work. Mm. Seriously. That's what separates people from those who are going to make it and those who don't. And he was like, I'm sure he was very happy inside because we were able to buy him a car for the first time in his life and get him a driver's license and all of that. And he, I'm sure he was happy. Prince, you know, was the same, you know, he did not want to show you too much emotion, you know, but the interesting thing was that he was just like, okay, let's get to work. If you look at that check in the book, it's made out to Prince and my company. Mm -hmm. Okay. And, and so it was very much a joint effort at that time. Now, look, I'm not making any claims to anything. Once uh, once Prince started to grow into his own and after we split up, he just took off at lightning speed and he was a brilliant guy who had absorbed everything. But I also want to make another statement too. And that's that from day one, when Prince and I got together, the whole plan was to keep control under our umbrella. Mm. Uh, all the press kits were done at my marketing firm with my uh, art director uh, even the first album cover, that four U album cover with him in a streak kind of coming back from his face and his eye, that was done by my art director, Jeff Ramakis. Uh, we did the promotional pieces and we did not want to leave Minneapolis. We wanted to record in Minneapolis because as much as we knew how great Warner Brothers was, we didn't want him popping in on, you know. And Prince just wanted to work very singularly to make this, you know, make this album happen with Andre by his side at that point. And so the whole idea from the get was, and, you know, not many people should do this. Don't try this at home because your record label art departments do have good input. But back in those days, our, our joint plan was to keep the control in, and keep it in Minneapolis. And one of the problems that hit us was that the, the studio got very excited before we started recording the album and they, um, they put in a new soundboard and it was glitchy. So like, uh, it just wasn't working. So the executive producer, producer, Tommy Vacari said, um, you know, let's, let's, we got to go back to LA and make this album. And we still didn't want to do it. And by the way, let me back up for a second under, uh, under the control column here. Not only w- were we going to control everything, including the recording, but 
Prince had to be his own producer. Mm -hmm. So I had before the ink wasn't even dry in the Warner Brothers contract. And I was up and up the ass of Warner Brothers saying, okay, by the way, he's never going to make, he's going to produce his own album. No one else is producing him. So the whole plan was to keep, which Prince eventually evolved into on his own through Paisley and everything. Stay in Minneapolis, do everything out of Minneapolis. So we tried to establish that in the beginning, but when the soundboard didn't work, the uh, engineer, the executive producer wanted to go back to um, Los Angeles. And I said, no, I'll compromise. We'll go to San Francisco because not as easy to pop in on us and all this other kind of stuff. And um, uh, there was something else that I didn't write about this, that it happened is that at one point, when we were looking for a record deal, CBS records put us in the studio cause they didn't believe he could play all the instruments. <laughs> so, uh, Prince is in the studio making just walking in and out, picking up an instrument and adding to the tracks, but we took a break and he, now this was before he got signed and he decided to go walk, you know, snoop around the other studios. It, it, I think it was village recorders. Well, there were a number of, famous artists recording hmm. uh, on different floors in different rooms. And he just walked in, <laughs> you know, and sat down and listened to them recording. Wow. But what it taught him was that that's why he didn't want to be in LA. He did not want people to be, he says, you know, I walk in on this dude and he's making a, one, an album that turned out to be multi-platinum and I'm just walking in there. He says, I don't want people walking into my studio with a mm. cup of coffee and sitting down, you know, listening to my shit. I don't want that. I want to do this, you know, as uh, hidden as possible and just create my work. So that was a big thing, too. Wow. So we decided on uh, uh, when the board went down, it was a state of the art studio, by the way. And David Z had done all of our demo tapes at Sound 80 because we had to redo the Chris moon tapes cause they were good, but they weren't the, you know, mm-hmm. demo, uh, you know, s- demo quality to present to major record labels at the time. They had done a good job. And that, that whole San Francisco recording time in the book, it, 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 so many classic like interactions or chance meetings with some of the biggest people in the game, which I could just see yeah. in a movie, I could see like the young Prince and like, you know, the whole Shaka Khan thing. And then the, Santana, <laughs> and I, I don't think it was in your book, but I, I understand Sly actually was at the studio one time or something. I think Andre was Well, Sly, about. I believe, either owned a piece of the record plant or because there was a famous room there. He either owned a piece of the record plant at that time where he cut a lot of the stuff or he owned a room there or they gave him a room. Because mm. his room, <laughs> his recording room, it was a chair. You know, so maybe a picture a recliner that you might lie back on, you know. Mm. But it was a tongue. It was it was shaped like a human tongue. <laughs> Jesus Christ! And Fly had built this in his studio, so he's like laying on this tongue, and then on uh, on the bottom of the chair tongue or tongue chair, whatever you want to call it our input for instruments or his guitar. So he could lay out on this tongue and, and, and do it. So he was connected to the studio somehow. That's why Chaka, there's a famous story. I don't want to go into the whole thing. I read about it, but where uh, Prince enticed Chaka to come down to the studio (laughs) thinking it was Sly Stone. Yes. (laughs) So, uh, but I remember that I'll never forget that giant tongue, you know, just right there and you just lay on it at pillows. And he, that's where he recorded. Wow. <laughs> that's um, cool. uh, so there's a there's a couple instances in the book where, uh, you know, Prince will, you know, even like, you know, want to produce and there's, there's different things that he would want to do that for most people, an unsigned or for a guy who hasn't have a proven track record, wouldn't probably ask for these types of things or they wouldn't even try to let you get away with that but the fact that obviously he could back up everything he's talked about but was there a sense from you as a uh, manager where you was kind of like you know i don't i don't know how to say it 
this guy can get away from me or he's going to, how much do I let him sort of uh, ask for things and I just say I can do, but what happens when you say you can't do, um, you know what I'm saying? Like, uh, well, you know, the, the greatest, well, there's two things. Number one, I, I, being a musician myself, I could sense and hear what he was doing. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and I think his confidence level coupled with this immense talent made it a lot easier for me to fight for him. Now, other people didn't understand him the way I understood him. And that made it kind of hard because I'd say, okay, he's going to be his own producer. They're like, you fool. Well, you're from Minneapolis, Minnesota. Who's there? The Pillsbury Doughboy? Is that, isn't that the biggest star? What do you guys know? And then I had to really fight. But I fought because I believed in Prince. Uh, not because it was just some wild scheme that we came up with. And there's also a time you have to, as a manager, you have to say no to your artist. Now, what happens a lot of times is an artist will interpret that as, oh, you don't believe in me? which it actually, when you say no to an artist and you look out for an artist and you're not afraid to bring them the reality and the reality blows of the business, you're actually, if you can't do that, you're harming them. In my book, a manager who says no to an artist for good reasons actually cares more than anyone in the room. And, act, and you know, and, you know, I've had that with every artist that I've managed. You know, they don't want to hear no. Nobody wants, who wants to hear no, you know? Um, but it is the, act, the, the, it's a great act of caring. You don't want your artist to spend a ton of money because they're going to be bankrupt. You don't want them to make this move. Most of the moves that Prince wanted to make at that time were pretty real and genuine. So I didn't have trouble, you know, fighting, uh, fighting him at all. Um, the the only time we sort of came to fisticuffs, not really, I'm teasing when I say that, but was I did not want him to, to you know, he wanted to headline right out of the box. Mm -hmm. And I didn't want him to do that. A, I knew you, you can get killed as an act. And, and I, he wanted to headline right out of the box. And I knew that to do that, we'd have to put a band together. Then we'd have to take money from the record label, form of tour support. And the more money you take from your record label, oh, they're all, they were all happy to give you money. <laughs> because what happens, you owe that back to them out of your royalties. Right. If you, if you can't pay them back, if your first album doesn't do that well, Going into your second album, you're going to owe them a boatload of cash. And then what happens? They take more control over you. So the kind of fight that Prince and I have, no, I didn't want him to put a band together too early. And uh, because you got to salary everybody, now you got to buy gear. Now you got to do all this, this stuff, which can be, which can add up to a lot of money. So I was trying to keep a pretty tight control on that end because I didn't want him to get over in debt to the record label, which people do on their first albums. Makes it very different. But the problem a manager has is that everybody's whispering in the artist's ear and trying to tell them yes. Mm. These are people who maybe had their own failed career who are now living vicariously through an artist. And it happened. It happened with every single artist that I managed. Somebody would come up and man, man, your manager, you know, I can do this, man. My, my cousin's got this dude who can, you know, and so, you know, I was not as keenly aware of it as I was in later years, but there were people who, if a manager is going to say no, there are people for their own motives who will say yes. And I had to battle that. And that is probably one of the things that, that kind of, you know, caused, you know, some rip in the fabric between us, to be honest with you, because I loved Prince like a son or a brother, he was probably too young, too old to be my son, but I don't know how to, you know, he was familiar to me. And I think in some cases we are, our, our histories, although we weren't, <laughs> 
we weren't the same color. <laughs> I don't know how to, <laughs> but our histories were very identical in terms, you know, I don't, un- I don't pretend to understand his experience and he brought, he never pretended to understand mine, but there were very similar events in our histories. And so we were kind of joined from that too, maybe being made fun of a little bit for certain reasons, uh, maybe being picked on a little bit for certain reasons. And so we shared that commonality and, and, and for all those reasons, I think that, uh, I, I felt very close to him and I really wanted him to understand where I was coming from, but there's also the, there's always the yes people. Uh, in, in in your book, so, you call them the whisperers. Now, I think I know what you're talking about. <laughs> I, I'm not. Uh, we're not. We're not trying. Man, let people. me tell you something. I've had I've had two things happen to me since I'm coming out with this book. I've been at parties and people are introduced to me, and the person I'm being introduced to says, "Yeah, man, I'm the one who discovered Prince and managed him and got his deal." And I'm like, "Hey, oh, cool, hilarious. cool to meet you." You know. <laughs> 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 then there's the second type of person. The, I call it the revisionist history person. Mm. They somehow found a way to insert themselves into the history. <laughs> you know, I wow. picked up a book the other day and I wrote a book about a guy, a dude who said he came over to my office and fired me <laughs> from managing <laughs> print. Wow. Who, who, who was and this I'm dude? Like, who I can't, I can't tell you because he's kind of, he's known. <laughs> mm. And he claimed that he fired me. He came over to my I caught, you know what I did? I spent, I texted him because I know him, but I texted him that song by the OJs called backstabber. Hysterical. <laughs> <laughs> I picked up this book and it's like, yeah. So then I went over, to, you know, and, and he, and he's, and I fired Owen and Owen said, Prince ain't going to be nothing. Mm. You know, if you knew me and you knew me at that time, there would be nothing further from the truth because I had walked out of an $8 million a year company that I owned for him. I had turned my entire company in, into doing everything for Prince. And again, it was because of Prince who he was, you know, I wouldn't have done it for anybody. Uh, moved away out of my hometown to, to, to live like a family in San Francisco and Los Angeles. So when people start coming with this stuff and they start revising history so that they can place themselves within history, you know, there's nothing really I can do about it. That's why I won't even name his name or, or anything like that because it just is. And then pretty soon history, it's like politics, you know, pretty soon history, the real truth generally starts to come out. And so uh, I just wait, but I did send him that song about them. I did send them back. Wow. <laughs> in, in the, in, in the book, you know, and again, I, I'm going to keep imploring people to read it for themselves is that, uh, you know, it sort of, it comes down to this uh, request about space heaters, but I can understand it's a way bigger thing than that. But in terms of, you know, going back to what you said at the beginning of this, uh, when that whole thing with the plane crash happened, when you said, you know what, people are not going to tell me what to do at a certain point or I'm not going to allow somebody to speak to me a certain kind of way. That sort of whole right. thing that happened there with the space heaters and all that kind of stuff <clears throat> from, at the rehearsals, uh, right. was it just a point where you just was like, you know, I don't, I don't know if there's more I can do for Prince or uh, I'm just going to wait for him to come to me or I mean, what was sort of running through your mind at that point. Well, and it's really funny because I'm now seeing the hashtag space heater. <laughs> <laughs> I am starting to see that. And the space heater is nothing more than if you, you're in a relationship with someone and somebody burns the toast for breakfast, you have a big fight over the toast. It's never about the toast. Right. right? You know, it's a much deeper issue. Space heaters were just sort of the, uh, you know, the connotation of, 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 of what it was. But I know it's hard for people to imagine this and to think back, but we were so close. We were so tight. Remember, we lived together, you know, in the house. It, 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 you know, he was over at my house all the time. Then we actually, the family moved in, into San Francisco. My dog, my wife, Andre, Prince, me. And we were like kind of a family unit. 
And, you know, so my experience with Prince and Andre was, man, get those dishes into the sink and get that garbage out, you know. But the difference was I didn't drive the kids, you know, down the hill to play soccer. I drove them to a studio to make history. (laughs) That was the only difference in that. Mm. So when you get to know someone on that level, it's a lot deeper and it's a lot different, you know, and you're having really headstrong conversations with them and you're talking at night about certain things and you're listening to Prince talk about his vision. It's a lot different, you know, than, you know, flash forward 25 years from even that date and he's an icon, Purple Rain and everything. So when it, when things started to, when I really started to want to watch the dollars because I didn't want to get too in debt to the record label. Uh, and people are whispering and all of that. They're saying, Hey man, your, your manager should be doing this and your manager should be doing that. And these people that are saying this have never managed anybody before. It's just their thought, you know, from some movie they saw or something, you know, and it's not anywhere's basis in the truth. It did start to put a, um, a strain, you know, Hey man, your manager should be getting you space heaters. You know, no, I think even Des Dickerson talks about it a little bit in his book, or we've discussed it that at some point, because people were talking to Prince, he was starting to conflate the idea and forgetting that I'm not his runner. I'm his manager. Mm. And we had people to do that, but no man, your manager should be doing that. So it started to get a little tense for that reason. And I explain it in the book because I was waiting for a major talent agency to call us. To, mm-hmm. I was going to try to help him get on that tour, but I still, and to this day, would never want him to, to break out and be a headliner because you have to pay your dues for so many reasons. You have to, and he wound up, right? You know, he wound up uh, op- uh, opening for Rick James, mm-hmm. et cetera, et cetera. You have to do that. You just, it, you just have to do that. There's no way around it. Uh, if you go out, you'll get killed. Seriously. And and he found that out when he played in front of the Stones for the first time, how ruthless an audience can be. They were throwing boots and shoes at him, you know. And you got to go out, even if you, we went to some small towns in Minnesota where I knew he would be accepted or certain clubs in Minneapolis where I knew the audience would be open to him and go do those gigs. But the whisperers were getting in there. I, in at my point, I was starting to look like an ogre because I'm insisting that no, we don't spend the money and let's work out a band. Let's find some places for you to play. Let's get jump on an opening situation, which I could put together with Warner brothers and, and the large talent agency. And, so I knew the future. I knew how it could turn out. I knew that he'd have to go and, and be in front of people because I'll tell you something, this is for any art. You want to know how your songs are? Go play them in front of a live audience, mm, mm. you know, in, in, as an opening actor in a club someplace, you'll find out before you get out on the big time, what songs work and what songs don't work. Okay. So, you know, maybe that song you wrote that you thought was a huge hit record gets no reaction from an audience. Maybe that stupid song you wrote about some girl three years ago that you throw out onto the set, you know, uh, you know, some love breakup that you thought was stupid. You play that and all of a sudden it's striking an arc of emotion with your audience. Oh man, that's cool. That works. So you build that playlist. And, but I had done that all my life and I had been with all many major artists all my life uh, from Jagger to even Sonny and Cher, Alice Cooper, Sly Stone, Janis Joplin. So I had seen their arc of development. If you know what I mean, if you know what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. And so I had seen that arc of development and I knew he had to do that, but it gets very tough when people locally who have never amounted to anything in their life are saying, man, you know, he should have bought you a Rolls Royce and you should know, you know, I'm exaggerating the point, but that's what it's like. And so there was a tenseness that built up and it, I had to make a decision at one point. Uh, I think my job as protector, you know, I did a great job. 
I got him a great deal, got him to be his own producer, got him to take control of his artwork. Maybe it's, maybe it is time. Maybe it's time for me to pass the baton on to the next person. And I think, you know, I wasn't mad. I wasn't, uh, you know, uh, it wasn't like, oh man, I'm going to sue this guy until he can't walk because that happened. It happened to Billy Joel. It happened to um, Creedence Clearwater, to Fogarty with their managers. No, I was not going to be the guy that destroyed his career by keeping him in court. Mm. So even though I had an ironclad contract, it was best that he move on because that's the greatest caring that I could give him mm. because how could I not? It's like, it's, you know, it, it, it's, 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 you know, at one point I distanced from my parents because they didn't understand what the hell I was doing. God bless them. Why should they? And I distanced from my parents. But after my mother died, I had found that she had kept a scrapbook of everything that I had ever done that was in the press or the paper. And that's the way I felt about Prince. It was, you know, man, go on and do it. You know, and I'm not, and, and number two, I'm not an idiot. I wasn't, I wasn't going to, you know, uh, uh, sue him. And then who else was going to come to me for man? Oh, aren't right. you the guy that screwed over Prince? Would you do my career too? Oh, that'd be fun to be screwed <laughs> over by you. So, <laughs> so, you know, I put all that stuff together. I had, um, I had a, a relative, a family relative who had a record label with a ton of hit records in the early sixties. And I, you know, he was 40 years older than me. And I went and talked to him and he said, look, I said, I'm getting into this tug of war, which I don't want to do. I care about this kid way too much. And he said, do you believe in yourself? I said, yeah. He said, do you believe that you can go on in, in the business and have a future? I said, yes. He said, then let him go. Uh, and have the confidence of what you did and then move on and build your other companies and your other business. And you know what was good about that advice is that once Prince and I separated, it didn't take Andre very long when he made a decision. Andre came to me and he said, you know, I'm going to leave the revolution. And I said, are you sure you want to do that? He said, yeah, I, I, I am. I said, well, you make sure and then you come to me. And then after all, I signed another artist, Sue Ann, to Warner Brothers, then signed Andre to CBS, Columbia. Uh, we signed the girls. And then Jesse came to me and it was the same thing. It's, man, I'm, I, 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 it's time for me to leave the time. Mm. And I said, well, are you sure you want to do that? You know? <laughs> and he said, yeah, I am. I said, come on over and play me your stuff, just like Andre did. And damn, it, you know, in both cases, their music was great. And I think if I would have screwed over Prince, I would never have worked with those guys or anybody else in my future. So I think it was a smart decision at the time. And I never harbored any resent, you know, towards Prince at all. There might sometimes I saw him make some moves and I was like, damn, why did he do that? That was stupid, you know, <laughs> but I wasn't going to call him. And tell him you know? so, uh, did, and did you ever... Then time I was gonna yeah. say, did you ever speak to Prince after that? I would yeah, we, you did. yeah, we we caught up a couple of times. Okay. Uh, he called me a couple of times. It wasn't like he was coming over for coffee and donuts, but he was always aware of what I was doing. Uh, he showed up backstage in San Francisco when I was managing uh, Jesse. We were at one of those. I forget, it was a Bud Light show, like 20,000 people. Prince showed up and, and chatted in the dressing room for a minute. I was at Paisley with Bobby Z, late eighties, early nineties, I want to say. And I was doing a project with Bobby Z at Paisley. He heard we were there. Uh, Bobby was out at that time, out of the revolution. And Prince came down into the studio. And I realized that it was after Purple Rain, it was probably 89, 90, I want to say. I realized how much both of us had changed when he came into that studio, we had both changed quite, I had obviously grown in what I was doing and who I was. And I noticed that he had changed quite a bit. You know, he was still Prince, but there was, a. I think he had added many layers onto himself. I don't know, either protectively or something else. And 
and I realized also that I was a different person than I had been in 1976, you know, at that point, but both of us still in, you know, still in the business. What, what, and, do, you mean, what do you mean by uh, he changed, he had layers? Was he like more guarded to you or he something? Had a, yeah, well, he was kind of guarded, but he had some more airs and some more affectations that, see, I didn't, this is really hard for me to talk about, but, and I don't want to touch upon this except for this sentence. When I heard, you know, where he was when he passed away, mm-hmm. that was something, and this is easy for me to pay to say, and the people are listening, they probably say, oh, it'll be easy for you to say on. Oh, I did not, wa- I did not want that to be the ending. Mm. I wanted him to live life as in the norm a little bit more than maybe even I admit that he was capable of. I know he did not want to do anything normal, but the thing that really threw me down on the floor when he passed away was where he was when it happened and that there was really not a lot of people around him. Uh, Okay. And it, it hit my heart and, and, and because that's what I was, kind of fighting against that. No, we still all have to live in this world, you know, and, mm-hmm. and, and do that. So I don't want to go into it. It's very tough to talk about, but, but, but that was kind of what I was setting up. No, man, come on, let's, you know, and he did, you know, when we broke up, he wrote me a letter, which I have, uh, I probably four people have seen it and two of them are my kids. Mm. He wrote me a four page letter on the inner sleeves of, uh, of Al, remember those old inner sleeves on album? Mm-hmm. Some of them were, were white and you pull them out and yeah. four front and back four pages. Wow. Uh, it, 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 because he, re, he felt the breakup too. You know, we were very, very close. Now there were things that he needed to be done and things that he wanted to do, but you know, he, he wrote me this letter and he told me he loved the person I was and uh, you know, maybe I come off this way at certain times and I, and he apologized. He said, I'm sorry for that. You know, I read the letter in two ways. It was, yeah, he was sort of wanted to continue to work with me and B it was a little bit of a cry for help is that, you know, he, he could see himself isolating himself a little bit and he maybe tried to be like other people and, Hey, how are you? Let's, you know, uh, let's, let's take the bus downtown, you know, but he wasn't that because at that point he was starting to formulate in my mind. And again, I don't want to ever presuppose where another person's coming from. And I've heard people describe, well, Prince was thinking this, no, you don't know that. But from my point of view, he was bege- He just wanted to concentrate three hundred percent on writing music, playing music, performing music, recording music, and that's all he wanted to do. And he wanted everything else done for him. Now you have to. That's time travel back. His first album hadn't really even made. You know, it was just starting to come out, and it hadn't even really made. You know, it it made a bigger splash in later years than it did in the beginning. First mm-hmm. albums are first albums. So I felt it was too soon, but I understood where Prince was coming from. He was saying, I just want to write, record, play, you know, perform music. I don't want to do anything else. Mm-hmm. That bothered me a little bit because I had been around a lot of stars in the business who had kind of isolated themselves. And it was the one thing I didn't want, but who am I? I don't have control over that. That's under only under his control. So that's why it affected me, you know, when I heard the news. Um, and so, I mean, I don't have too much more to say about that. It's just that I wanted him to go on. I, uh, it was all fairly peaceful, you know, uh, uh, me turning my contract over to somebody else. But the thing that happened was the whisperers at that point then organized this Capri theater thing, Mm -hmm. which was exactly what I was fighting against. Don't do that. And 
they organized this thing and they were, they were yes and Prince. Yeah, man, you could do it. You're a headliner. And, you know, for all intents and purposes, retrospectively in history, it had its place in the formation of his going forward. You know, everything positive or negative has an effect upon your future. And if you're smart, it can be a very good effect, but it was pretty dismal that performance, you know, because a lot of expectations Mm -hmm. and I know the Warner brothers people, even though I was off the case by that point, they all called me the next day, man, he wasn't ready. I said, well, I'm not managing him anymore. He wasn't ready to do that show. And we had to stand outside and it was fucking 40 below zero. <laughs> they were making us wait out. And all these dudes who have just one button on their shirt, you know, because everything, but, you know, they were all standing outside in Hawaiian shirts, 40 below zero. Oh, wow. so, <laughs> right. And, and they didn't have their confidence together. Prince, they all called me. I didn't go to the show, but Prince had his back to the audience. He hadn't put it together yet. Mm-hmm. And so my thinking was right, but hey, you know, what do they say about the uh, Monday morning quarterbacking? It's always true and it's always useless, you know? <laughs> so, right. But I didn't, it's, I didn't want that. And a lot of people called me, including members of the band saying, Oh man, we made a big mistake by doing that. We should have listened to you all. And I said, well, you know, it's a learning curve for everyone. So no, I don't have some big, I hate you story. <laughs> I give, yeah, no more than I could hate my own children. You know what I'm saying? It's, it's, right. Uh, now it's 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 like one of those things all, when your kids sometimes they want to do something. You tell them one thing, it's like, "Well, you gonna learn for your own. Uh, somebody gonna get this whooping. Uh, you gonna learn, yeah, gonna exactly. learn one way or the other." <laughs> Man, don't drink and drive. And oh yeah, Dad, you're fucked up. You don't get it, Dad. You don't. And then they hit a phone pole, and then they realize, right, that, right. you know, um, you can't do it. Can can we just? Uh, I don't know how much time you have left, because <clears throat> uh, there's so many things you mentioned. But after Prince, uh, you know, you talked about Andre, but Jesse Johnson, um, if you can. Uh, so you worked with Jesse for Jesse Johnson's review, Shockadelica, and also uh, Every Shade of Love. Were you managing? Yeah, mm-hmm. man. Okay. Yeah, those those are classic and, albums. Uh, <laughs> Of really seriously classic albums. And I'll never, I'll never forget the day Jesse drove over to my office on Oak Grove in Minneapolis there. And he drove, you know, I, I get a call from Owen, oh, you know, can I, do you mind if I pop by? Yeah, come on. I had a studio then. I had built a 24 track in my office and he said, do you mind if I come by? But he didn't want to play the music in my studio. Mm. And I remember sitting outside in his car and he played me some stuff. And I was like, oh, man, this shit is so good. <laughs> you know, I don't know where he recorded. I think he might have had a little studio. I don't, can't remember where he had done it. It was a demo. And it was like, oh, man, this stuff is so good. And Jesse and I are just sitting in the car, and, you know, my wheels are turning. Okay, I know what I can do for him, you know. And I got to tell you, at that time, which would have been, what, about 84 or so, I think, right around in there, mm-hmm. and, these kids from Minneapolis were, they were faced with a little bit of a problem because Princess Star was flying so high that it was difficult because there were either two labels, two types of people at record labels that wanted artists from Minneapolis. Those, um, and, and some who didn't, uh, those who wanted their piece of Prince so they would sign an artist, you know, they wanted their clone of mm-hmm. Prince, mm-hmm. which would have been wrong. That would have hurt the artist's career. Or they didn't sign him because they felt it was too close to Prince's orbit. Mm. So it really took someone to understand. And I think several artists got hurt by that in Minneapolis. Um, so I had to, when I went out to find labels, for Jesse and to make pitches to the labels, there were a bunch of them that did not want to sign him. Hmm. And I'm going, what are they out of their minds? <laughs> you know, this is thoroughly original music. And he had written a couple of yes, you know, mm-hmm. 
I finally got to John McClain. I don't know if you know who he is. At yes. A&M. He was at A&M mm-hmm. and, and John's history grew. John and I became actually very, very good friends. Yeah, he had, a, he had, he was just as hard headed and stubborn as his prince and everybody else was, but he had tremendous vision. And when I played him Jesse's demo, he just boom, boom, boom. He got every part of it. And he said to me, this is what we got to do. You know, I don't want him to be a Prince clone. You know, still the comparisons would come, but here's how we're going to differentiate. And he was also very musical because he played guitar with the Jacksons and he was also best friends with the Jackson five and best friends Uh with the mother. John wound up. Is that how we got with Janet working with Janet and stuff? Yeah, well, he we did the first Janet album, That's Green right. Street, That's right. with yeah. Jesse. That's right. And he met all of them through Jesse and me coming to Minneapolis. That's how all that got put together. Okay, okay. And uh, and and so we did the we did the first album, but John got it. John got what Jesse was doing. Jesse had written what Jungle Love and, and the Bird or something like that, you know, in the time. And, uh, so John knew of his talent and, um, and so John got him immediately when I came by and I'm records and he understood it. And I went back to Jesse and I said, I think this is a home for you because John gets you. And by the way, A&M was a very family oriented label too, who was very artist friendly, like Warner brothers. Mm-hmm. And they had had massive hits, you know, they had the brothers Johnson mm-hmm. and then they also had, um, well, Joe Cocker. <laughs> they, I mean, they had a, a pretty good range. Quincy Jones was tied into the label at the time. So, uh, the long and short of it is, is that John got it. Uh, we fought for control again. And really? Jesse got to build his own studio okay. in his house in Minneapolis. John came back and forth, freezing to death from LA. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and, and, but you know, you never get signed and you never have hit records unless you're, unless it all comes down to a song and it all comes down to, you know, what you can put together. And, uh, uh, I'm still very friendly with both Andre and Jesse. In fact, almost everybody that I've signed, I'm, I'm still pretty friendly with. And I'm always blown away by the talent. I'm blown away by Andre Simone's talent. I'm blown away by Jesse Johnson's talent. By the way, I think Jesse's probably one of the top five guitar players in the world today. Yeah. And I'm always blown away, you know, and he always operated a little left of center. You know, Jesse didn't want to go along with the crowd either. Uh, let me, but it all comes oh, down ahead. to what I heard in this car. No, go okay. ahead. Sir. Oh, I want to. Well, first of all, so the the first album. I mean, right out the gate, he had hit songs off of that, and then I also remember, you know, he had the big uh, B side. Uh, God, can I Free tell World. you a story? Free about World, that? yes, yeah, please, please, go Free ahead. World. Free World was great. Uh, there was a lot of stuff, you know, that he done and that he had done at that time, but. You know, Jesse listened to me on one account. It was really great. And it was what I was trying to prevent. And, you know, is that I didn't take a lot of money from A&M Records in the form of uh, of an advance. Hmm. In fact, you know, I took a minuscule amount of money. Now, Jesse had a little bit of a reputation. He had some money coming in from the songwriting. But we took a very low advance. And what happened was, see... What happened was it played perfectly because his album took off. That first album took off like crazy. And I'm telling you within five or six weeks, that thing went gold. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So the record label was like, man, we didn't even have a big investment of this kid and he took off. So then I was able to go back and get anything I wanted (laughs) out of the record label at that point. Uh, And, and it, it, it really played out very nicely because we started to make money off of that album from the get because we didn't take very much. And then they gave us the key to the golden room and said, here, whatever you guys need, we believe you. The album had gone gold right away. Nice. Uh, and, and, you know, I would, same thing. I'd go over and listen to Jesse's songs. He lived about, I don't know, 40, 
50 minutes out of Minneapolis. I'd have to make that drive in the cold, you know, and go there. And then I'd go out and he had the studio was always on 150 degrees. <laughs> so we'd go in there and I would just be blown away by stuff he was creating. He's a great uh, tunesmith, a great craftsman. I know those sound pretty mechanical, but he, he's got a great sense you know, uh, of crafting a song. Let, let me also so. ask you, there's one other thing that always, I always wanted to know the story of this. And I, I don't know if you can speak on it. So on the second album, Shaka Delica, well, there's two things, obviously that the title of the song, uh, you know, then Prince comes out with the song, the same title on a, the tour. No, I know, the tour. that was a little bit of a battle there. Yeah. <laughs> but, but before we go into that, I wanted to ask you, there's a song on this album that, Always trips me out. So the song, do yourself a favor. Do you, mm -hmm. I, I was, I heard a story where John McClain had that tape on his desk or something and Jesse heard it, but it would, I mean, to me, it would seem kind of weird. So this is a song uh, by Pepe, but, but mm -hmm. the version that Jesse does sounds like the version that Prince had recorded that was never released, but it's like Jesse's version of that. And I always thought it was just such a weird sort of, uh, God, I can't, re thing. you know, I know I haven't thought about that in about 40 years. <laughs> I'm sure <laughs> I'm going uh, deep geek. On it you. does. There was something, there was something on that. I can't remember. The, uh, I can't remember the full story. on it. I really can't. Uh, I'd love to be able to tell you, but I can't. Um, uh, but I do remember something about that. And I do remember there was some back and forth between Jesse and Prince over Shockadelica. I remember that. It might have been something Jesse came up with and Prince, you know. You know, a lot of times people don't actively steal stuff from you. It's they notice it, it gets filed away, and then it comes back to them years later mm -hmm. and they can't remember, they think it's theirs. And sometimes it really is not because you're devious. Sometimes it is, you know. <laughs> um, it seems to me, though, because uh, I'm reflecting on my conversation with Jesse, just you're bringing back memories, is that he was, I, he was concerned. I don't know, pissed is too strong a word, but he was very concerned because that he had coined that term, mm. I guess. But that's, you know, I'm going back on memory here, and yeah, yeah. don't trust me on that one. We'll all get in trouble. No, it, it was but just a, it was, to me that. Go ahead. I think Jesse felt that it was his title to begin with. That's okay. my recollection. All right. Yeah, it was an interesting time because I remember, you know, the song "Crazy" um, with Sly, right? And then there is yeah, uh, that was an experience. There, there is a uh, the twelve inch version of "Housequake." You know, Prince he samples that song yeah. in there he plays a little bit of crazy in that i don't know if you remember that or i heard about that it's always like i say it was yeah i do some, remember that yeah. i do remember that i don't think we ever sued him <laughs> <laughs> uh probably should have <laughs> um it, it seemed like it was a friendly type of rivalry competitiveness going on between them I, that's how it seemed well let me tell you this uh there was a lot of ruthless competitiveness going on mm. there. Okay. Okay. <laughs> I don't, I don't want to go gangster that far with it, you know, uh -huh. but there was a lot Prince. If you think that dude wasn't competitive, then he watched everything. Mm. And, you know, he was a very competitive guy. You know, you don't get to his stature just because you were, you know, petting Bambi out there in the woods, you know, <laughs> uh, uh, and they all were, but look at it. The, I look at it this way, that ruthless competitiveness. Oh man, I, I came up with that lick. Yeah. Well, I'm going to be the one to do it, you know, mm. or vice versa, you know, that type of thing. It really affected them to become better musicians. Now they might disagree with me, you know, this is just my conjecture here, but there was a lot of competition going on with all of them stated or unstated. But the result of that was everyone was driven to do their best work. Okay. So there was a real positive, you know, thing coming out of that. I know I've, every person that I've managed, you know, felt, well, maybe Prince could have let me shine a little bit more here 
or, you know, hey, it seems to me that I came up with that lick. I came up with that blah, blah, blah. And there was a, there was a lot of that. I didn't know what the truth was because I wasn't there. But I do know that they were competing against each other in a way that drove them all to become better musicians. There was nobody saying, man, I'm going to go kill that guy or anything. There, there was nothing like that. I think the comparisons and everything came from more of the press and everybody on the outside, but there was a very large degree of competitiveness with everybody. Mm -hmm. Now, Jimmy Jam and Terry Lewis were kind of over here to the side on all that. I have a tremendous amount of respect for Jimmy and Terry. They're just, they're cool guys. They write great music. They play great. They know they make great moves, you know, and, uh, but they, they were all, they were all watching each other. They were all competing on, on some level. And remember, these are all young kids that knew each other who probably rode bikes together and built forts, you know, together and, and did crazy, stupid stuff all together. That's the, to me, that's the most amazing thing about Minneapolis. Now I know y'all over there in Seattle have your, <laughs> Seattle sound, right. you know, uh, uh, and I know, you know, I know it goes and we watch it. Uh, a lot of times it happens because there's a business entity that can help the creative. Mm -hmm. So case in point, when Bob Dylan was coming up, he's a Minnesota guy. And he was, had moved to Minneapolis from Northern Minnesota. There was no business infrastructure to take care of him. So he left and became a, a New York signing Greenwich village kind of a guy. Hmm. Enough infrastructure had been built up with studios by the time I came along and a management company to help think of it this way. Motown in Detroit, when Barry Gordy was in Motown and motor Motown was in Detroit with Barry Gordy running it. There was an act a week coming out of there. Mm -hmm. you know, Martin Gay. Jackson five and the Supremes and Martha Reese and the Vandell. I mean, it just goes on and on and on. Stevie wonder. Then he moves his operation to Los Angeles. Now there's an, an actor to a year coming out of there and that's it. You know, I think ready for the world. And I don't think the deal came out of there. I can't remember where they came from, but there, it just goes down because the, the infrastructure had left the town. Mm -hmm. And what happened with you guys in, in, or in Seattle, rather, uh, there was a business, there was a record label there, so at least on the Nirvana side of things mm -hmm. and, you know, all of that. So there was an infrastructure there to be able to keep the talent from leaving the city. Right. And that's what we hope to build. And that's what Jimmy Jam and Terry did too. They had that great studio. They're writing incredible songs. Jesse's got his studio. He's on the other side of town. He's got Janet Jackson and Janet Jackson in, in, in his house recording with him. You know, I had Andre over here. We had the girls, which we put together with Jesse put together, I should say, and produced and wrote, got them over here. You know, at one point it was that town and it still is. It was an amazing thriving community yeah of musicians that made its mark on the world. You know, I'm suddenly getting, you know, calls from Germany and France back then, you know, and it's this town that was just known as the Pillsbury Doughboy and 40 below zero before that. It's, it's amazing story. Somebody's well, going to do it. You know, what, uh, Two questions, you know, a broader music question, but in terms of like, you know, Minneapolis and the Minneapolis sound, in your opinion, what was sort of uh, the shift? Because at one point, that dominated music, you know, particularly, you know, black music. You know, you, you mentioned Ready for the World and all these different groups. Everybody wanted to be Prince, the time, you know, all of that kind of stuff and the sound of that. But what was, uh, in your opinion, and being in the business, when did you start to see a shift away from that where you know, these other things, whether it be hip hop or whatever was coming. Oh, I think that probably happened in the nineties when it did start to shift away and then people moved away. Mm, okay. I think even for a short period of time, Prince had Paisley. I think Jimmy Jam and Terry or Jimmy and Terry decided to go out to the coast. 
I was making moves out to the coast. Uh, and also there was on the other side of the things, there was a kind of a, a punk rock thing happening too. Okay. With the replacements and Husker Du and Bob Mould coming in, thriving. There's a studio that's so famous. It's, it's south of the Twin Cities. It's called Pachyderm. Hmm. I think Nirvana did one of their albums there. The whole thing began to grow. But the, sh- the shift away from the Minneapolis sound, I think, was as much a matter of the Minneapolis sound in itself, which, look, this is just my thoughts from watching it, but you know, the synthesizer came in at that time Mm -hmm. and, you know, people started exploring, you know, creating, you know, keyboard sounds and also horn parts that weren't real horns and violins and stuff. And I think a lot of the earlier print stuff had tons of synthesizer in it. I think that helped to, you know, define it. Um, And I think it got a little silly, not with, not with our people, but as other people started to pick up synthesizer kind of stuff, it, uh, it, I think they overplayed it, but I think in the beginning that had a lot to do with it. Uh, in, in just my opinion, somebody might mm-hmm. disagree with me. Uh, but there was a whole sound to that. You know, there was another thing that happened that I have to mention that drove everybody even further and that they won't even admit to it. <laughs> is that we in 79 or 80, we were like the Kings of the Hill, right? Man, we're badass, and Prince was badass, and uh, it's, we're, everybody's just bubbling under starting to make it, you know? And we came back from California, you know, and we were kind of badass people, and then all of a sudden, this record comes out of Minneapolis, mm. and it goes number one in every free capital city on earth <laughs> it's, it's called funky town right by <laughs> steve greenberg now literally we knew steve greenberg because he was playing weddings and bar mitzvahs he had an idea for a song called funky town and before everything broke loose he brought in david z mm. to do who did the prince demos who i brought in to do the second phase after chris moon by the way I give Chris Moon a lot of accolade. Trust me on this one. But uh, he brought in David Z, and uh, they had given they had come up with a song called Rocket just before that. It was like rock, rock, rocket, you know, kind of a thing like that. And I thought it was really cool. I sent it out to Warner Brothers uh, around 1979, and they said, "Well, we're not sure it's going to happen." And then his the second song he did in that same studio session or thereabouts was funky town. Won't you take me to, and David Z put together most of the tape loops and the sounds in that song. Have to credit Steve Greenberg who came right out of the wedding and bar mitzvah circuit and did it. But Dave, I credit David with the drum sounds, the, uh, uh, a lot of that sound came from him. And, uh, all of a sudden we're looking at this thing and damn, it's number one. You know, and I, I know for someone like Prince, you know, he may not have showed it. He took it in stride. But, you know, from what I'm able to observe, it was like, whoa, where'd that shit come from? You know, <laughs> we thought we were the one. And I think that helped drive everybody. And I think it did help open a lot of the doors in that town even even further. Then another thing happened. People started moving. And that came, moving to Minneapolis. Jesse came from Rock Island. Illinois. He drove up in his car one day and said, Hey, I'm here, you know, and, and a lot of people started arriving from other cities. So I opened up a recording studio, dance rehearsal place, uh, rehearsal room. We took over an old, uh, turn, uh, 1800s warehouse and converted it. And we then started what Barry Gordy had, which is kind of the school of music where you could come in, you could record either in a major studio or record in a little eight track room. You could rehearse your stuff uh, on all these levels of this old warehouse. That to me was the coolest part, but a lot of people drove, drove into Minneapolis. So the sound began to develop. I think it started waning in the nineties. You know, there's some, there's some decent rap and hip hop groups coming out of Minneapolis too. 
with you know like atmosphere yeah what was that big there's a big uh, label up there what was the they said they were pretty big for a minute there was like a record label conglomerate type. twin tone <sighs> twin tone was there they had all the kind of the punk rock you know kind of stuff but interestingly enough uh i was going to make a comparison to something else but i forgot it's but it was it was really uh it's just such an incredible time that I'm sitting in my office. I was on tour with Jesse Johnson and I had to come home to do my taxes. Actually, it's probably, you know, from 1985, I don't know how many years it is to now, but exactly now. And I come home and I'm like, I've been out on tour cause I always toured with my artists. I always rode the tour bus. By the way, if you ever ride the tour bus front berth, middle berth up towards right behind the drive. <laughs> That's the best ride, man. You go to the back of the bus, you're bouncing up and down. Like you're in a clown car, you know, but you know, front middle berth. All right. So I come home, I have had no sleep for, you know, cause you don't sleep and I'm trying to get some rest and then I'm going to meet with my accountant, then jump back out on the road. And this is when it really hit me. This was like 86, I think. So I'm trying to get some sleep. My phone rings and it's, um, uh, is this Owen? Yes. Hi, this is the governor of the state of Minnesota. I'm like, man, please, no jokes today. And I <laughs> fucked you and I hung up on him. The phone calls, get phone rings a little bit later. Uh, is this Mr. Husty? Yes, please stop. No, I really do have the governor of the state of Minnesota on for, with you. So I'm like, oh, excuse me. Sorry. I just told him to fuck off. <laughs> and, and uh, next thing I know, I'm that evening at the governor's mansion discussing music in the state of Minnesota because it had become such a large business. Wow. And then I got put on a task force by the governor who was great. He was totally down for the arts. And uh, we put together a task force to study because, you know, governors like business being brought into the United, you know, into their state for tax revenues and every other kind of reason. And so uh, then next thing I know, he says, you know, I hear the black music awards are coming up. I became really good friends with the governor. And um, next thing I know, the black music awards are coming up. And, uh, and uh, I think Pete Rhodes was putting them on at the time. And he calls me up. He says, let's have everybody over to the mansion, you know, for dinner. So next thing he has this great party at the governor's mansion. And I'm thinking, damn, I'm friends with the governor, man. I could get a stay of execution if they want to (laughs) be in the electric chair. This is a good relationship to have, but it was all through these kids that grew up and were making music. It's phenomenal. Mm. It's really a phenomenal story. And, uh, you know, we, he was very involved in, in music. And because of that relationship with the governor, he then put me on a task force to build a performing arts high school, which mm. the Perpich Center for the Performing Arts is one of the top performing arts high schools in the state. It's right in the suburb of Minneapolis called Golden Valley. And uh, it came full circle for me because my youngest son, who was extremely creative, was like in high school telling the teachers to fuck off and walking out of classes. And they came to me and they said, well, we don't know. We're going to have to put you in jail if he's truant anymore. And I said, no, you just don't get him. He's extremely talented. And then I got him in the arts high school that I helped create. And he went to the top of his class. And today he's a filmmaker living in New York. He's got a nine part documentary uh, that he's doing for Vice Media, Vice New, uh, oh, Vice man. Media, Vice their t- their station. Congratulations so it, on that, man. Uh, that's, that's dope. Nice. Yeah. I know, I know. That's nice. Wow. Uh, hang on one second. I uh, so um, so everything comes full circle as a result of that Minneapolis sound. But basically, I think the beauty and the magic of it is that it came from all these kids who knew each other who were teenagers. Right. And then built up into that sound, yeah, and that amazing. sound of whatever they were putting together. You know, and even if you listen to Jody Watley's album, that's got the Andre. Minneapolis sound. Oh yeah, that, yeah. Andre and David Z did that one too. Still a thrill. So, that was uh, the cut. 
I'm sorry, what? Said steal the thrill. I mean, that was a that was a big was jam. Good. Yeah, Thomas. right, right, right. And and yeah. the the, the, oh, yeah. the label I was talking about, making sure I would give everybody gets their props to the Minneapolis was Rhyme Sayers. Uh, it was a big hip hop. They call <laughs> yeah Rhyme Sayers Entertainment. They they were like the big hip hop. Uh, yeah, uh, I heard of them, but I think I had been gone at that at that. Yeah, day. they were later. This was yeah, this was in '95. Um, you know what's interesting is that Prince. He just created great music and great songs. And I want to ask you guys this, so I'll reverse it a little bit. Mm -hmm. So I'm sitting in the business and I'm listening. I listen to every, I don't care if it's country and Western. I don't care what it is. If it's big, I study it. I want to know why. And so, you know, rap music starts to appear on the scene, double Dutch bus and, you know, uh, grandmaster. (laughs) And, and everybody's telling me, man, that shit's going to be over in a year. That's just a passing fancy. It's that rap crap. That's going to be gone. <laughs> meanwhile, it grows into now where it's part of our culture. You know mm-hmm. what I'm saying? It is that you're within our culture. But it's interesting. So I'll ask you, it, it, because Prince just makes great songs. I never considered Prince to be a rap artist, you know, and I think that he got waylaid a little bit by that. The bigger that rap got and the more prevalent it became. And he sort of had to wait that out in the, in the nineties, I think. And then he could come back in after it reached and settled down that then he could come back with his great music. I don't know if I'm right or wrong. I, it, Prince might have rapped once or twice. Or do you know? Yeah, quite a I'm bit of rap songs. That. Yeah, he had, a, he had a quite a bit of rap songs. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, he did. <laughs> but in some sense, did we always feel it was, that that was his him naturally? Maybe it was. But I know he did because I had heard stuff, but I didn't hear a lot. Now, I, somehow you guys know more about that than I do. But it's kind of interesting because I think that shifted the whole music event over from where it was in the 70s and in the 80s. And then as it grew bigger, I think it took a lot of people by surprise uh, and then just became what it is today. Now it's just like it's another genre of music that we accept and we appreciate. You know, I would, interesting. Yeah, I would say to that, and I think everything you said was on point to a degree, but I think from... Uh, like for me, you know, I grew up, uh, listening to, you know, I was a big fan of, uh, as a kid, Michael Jackson and then Prince and and all of that stuff. But I was also, you know, uh, when hip hop started, I immediately gravitated to that as well. And so I understood both of them. I think the thing with hip, hip hop was that it was music, but I think it was, uh, for us as the younger people at that time, it was just so authentic. We felt like it was us actually doing it as opposed yep. to, you know, the the Michaels and Prince and, and all these other iconic artists. They were like superstars, but they were like sort of not associated to us. Like we didn't believe we could ever be them. But we, I could believe mm-hmm. I could be Run DMC or, or, you know what I mean? Like they just seemed like regular mm-hmm. people that I knew, but they were just super talented uh, and I think what it was is that we identified with what they were talking about and the music was different. Uh, but for me, I loved both. And I understood there was some, some of my hip hop friends was like, man, why are you listening to that stuff? That's, that's corny. You know, they look, they don't even look, they, they look crazy. Well, how they dress like that, why they look feminine or this and that. But then, you know, I understood where all that came from. I understand the James and little Richards and the lineage of that and, and just soul music in itself. Yep. So I understood that and I grew up on that from my parents' side. But I think once you get to the point where we started growing up and hip hop was going to grow up with us. And then once we started to get more into the buying power and and different things, then, yeah, we were Mm going to bring that whole stuff right with us. And I think, too, once, you know, uh, in terms of the corporate side of Billboard, when they, you know, okay, we're going to do sound scan. So, you know, they can't really rig the system no more to, to act like they don't see hip hop <laughs> once they did, right, once they right, did that. Right. Oh, okay, NWA is number one? Like, where did that come from? Well, that's because that's what we really been listening to. You know, and I think those are the things that sort so of shift. There was more of an, I- so for you, there was more of an identification that because there was so much of a commonality that you felt, you felt that you identified with it very personally. 
but I mean, you probably identify with Prince songs, but you felt that this was you, that, that you could do this. Um, um, just sort of well that yeah out. that's the <laughs> other well it, yeah because you know with hip hop too it wasn't just rap you know it was graffiti you know it was dance it is a whole culture and we all were in mm-hmm. that culture it was a culture of style that we carried ourselves and that we spoke so right. that music was just a representation of that and then once it sort of shifts away from the hip hop and hip hop and then it gets into yeah. you know public enemy and, and it's a more issues of the day then we were done like oh okay we can have a, a sense of pride in this too yeah that you know right. so we identify with so that music was was yeah we it wasn't just singing about i love this girl it was singing about a lot of stuff that was happening around us and people that we knew so, right you know what i mean so it was just a different type of yeah thing. so there was a, yeah, a very strong identification yeah uh, and, and, and and then that music level in terms of I didn't really have access to the guitar or some of the other equipment, but we knew somebody down the block who had turntables. He was the neighborhood beat maker. Or, oh, we we can go get that drum machine. We we could afford to get that. So we understood, oh, we're going to learn how to sample these beats, you know, uh, mm-hmm. and, and do this music. We don't have to, I didn't have time to go to music class, but I had time to sit at home and compete with the guy down the street or who can make the best beat or Da, 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 and come up with the lyrics so that's sort of how that whole sort of everybody was going to learn that's how to great. rap type of stuff yeah so. you know there was a show i know we're digressing here but there was a show that got canceled that i think it was called the get down oh yeah <laughs> i don't know if you yeah. ever saw that i saw that yeah that Netflix. i thought was really cool uh you know i don't know how much the truth was but it what it reminded me of was minneapolis mm. mm-hmm. here is you know new york I can't remember if it's Brooklyn or uh, where it emanated from Bronx or Brooklyn or whatever, wherever. But it, I remember watching that and thinking, that's kind of like what we're, what we went through in Minneapolis. It's like, you know, guys are out there and they're doing stuff. Then all of a sudden it starts to connect and, you know, then the, the back and the forth and things that are dramatic things happening between, you know, between people, you know, maybe it didn't, catch on now another show that i saw i'm digressing is the show called vinyl yes. which was uh, produced mm-hmm. by mick jagger now that turned me off because that was during my lifetime <laughs> and you know they had people snorting cocaine and then just running wild in the streets you know and, <laughs> <laughs> you know no nobody ever did that it was so overplayed but i remember watching the get down and and saying you know, this is kind of cool. It's kind of giving people an education about maybe, I don't know if it's right or wrong or indifferent. I didn't grow up in New York, but it's giving people an indication of how a, how a music culture grows. And it was very synonymous with Minneapolis at that time. Now we didn't have another competing city, you right. know, like the LA wars. Between, we didn't have wars with St. Paul, Minnesota. Trust me. <laughs> but uh, I think it it is a, it is a lot of the same thing. You know, I think for a lot of us that didn't live in Minneapolis and for a lot of the world, we saw purple rain. And in terms of, at least for me, because I, you know, I was a musician myself, when I saw them practicing and I got a sense that, oh, they was, you know, there's a, there's this, the skill that goes into this and just turn the mic on and they say, you could see they was a band and they was playing and you could see the competitiveness, at least in the movie between, a Morris and a Prince come to find out there may really have been something there in reality. But I think for a lot of us, when we just, we saw it on that level, it's like, man, you know, Prince is actually putting in a lot of work. You know, we respect yeah. that. And and his stuff is good. Yeah. Let's learn how, how was he playing? And then when we start to hear these bootlegs and stuff and the rehearsals and all that for a lot of musician cats, it was a rap because then we was like, Oh, okay. This how they do. You, you get a bit. You get a little bit of the game. A little bit. You just saw glimpses a little bit. And I'll always say this, and you you may appreciate this. Uh, there was a Jimmy Jam, Terry Lewis. They had it was in their studio. Uh, they had Donnie Simpson from BET <clears throat> flew in. Yeah. It was a whole special, and they were working on Fishnet at the time, Morris Day song. But I- they literally, you know pulled up the tape and they had the, the 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 board and they were showing how tracks work and here's how here's the kick drum on this track and here's the this on this and to me i was school i was looking at that i was like oh that's how they do it and then they showed jimmy jam he was mm-hmm. at the 
he was cutting up the two inch, not the two inch tape, but uh, this is a one inch tape, whatever, real to real. And he was cutting it up and showing how they was doing the edit of the song, like with the razor blades right. and everything. And I was like, oh. Right. And from that, seeing <laughs> that, I called up studios in my hometown and said, oh, we booking studio time. Had never been in studio before. <laughs> But once I saw that, I realized I could do it. I said, oh, I know what they're doing. Okay, you let's go do it. So, yeah. So it opened up the door for it. So that was pretty amazing. Pretty, uh, and, and that's why I like Jimmy and Terry so much, too, because they, they, they have put back into the community, and they have put back into helping other people and being on different Grammy boards and doing stuff like that. And, and uh, you know, I caught up with Terry Lewis, well, it's a few years ago now when the time was going to come out as the original seven. Mm-hmm. And there might be some thought for a second that I would manage, you know, that the redo of that. And I didn't want them to call themselves the original seven. I wanted them to use the name, the time there was a little bit of a legal dispute with Prince at the time. And I said, man, mm-hmm. just, go out as the time and then change your name after everybody hears what you guys are doing <laughs> because I felt it was good. But I just remembered, and it was a great catch up time. Uh, Jimmy and Terry had a studio in, uh, in, uh, near Santa Monica. I went over there with Jesse just a few years ago. I went over probably at eight o'clock at night and Terry was in the studio. He was playing me stuff. We were just talking about stuff. And, all I know is I look, I look at my, it's like, damn, it's a quarter to six in the morning. <laughs> wow. We had just been catching up on everything and, you know, all the little disputes that we remember and man, no, see, he really didn't do that to you. you know? And just catching up on everything that had gone down, uh, over the period, uh, of years. And then Terry would play me some of the stuff they were working on. And it's like, you know, it's just it's such pure, you know, pure talent in, 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 in what's going on. And I remember saying to Terry, he's saying, man, we can't use the name of the time. I said, man, if it were me, see, I'm kind of bold. I would just send out all the original records uh, and call yourself the time, send it out as promo copies to DJs and get it out that way. And then you'll get a letter from somebody that says, Hey, you can't use it. Then you can always pull it back and change the name, but then you've created a story Mm. by that time because it was, you know, I always wanted the time to get back out there again and, 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 and do it. So, uh, but it was just interesting, uh, catching up with, you know, with Terry and, uh, hadn't talked to him in so many years and just such great, uh, uh, oh, just a minute. Hang on, just a minute. Take that. So, uh, well, let, let me ask you this. Let me ask you this, this last. This, hopefully, maybe this last question. But what do you want us fans and different people out there to remember about Prince? That, um, I what I want you to remember. Let me let me give that some thought. Yeah. Uh, what I'd like you to remember about, well, you got an hour. <laughs> <laughs> I, I do actually. But <laughs> that's what I would say. Okay. Uh, I understand. Oh, oh, you do. I do. Oh, well, hey. I, <laughs> um, I, it's really hard to put into words because it, it, it's just, you know, true, true, true talent is undefinable. And it's always, it's always the magic that we can't define. You know, what separates somebody who makes a good song to somebody else whose song just takes off and, and does that. But I think if there's anything I would like to, and I, you know, I teach at UCLA, I teach the business of music because I like to give back. What I talk, you know, you know, my, my, my students are not allowed to ask me any tell all questions or anything like that, but they're asking me, they, they do ask me a lot of questions about Prince. And the, the, I've mentioned it earlier that it's not just enough to have a passion for music. You've got to work very hard at your, at your craft. Prince was driven. 
he turned himself inside out for us mm-hmm. to deliver his gift. He was focused. He was driven. He was demanding. Brilliant as all get out. You know, there, uh, there's no superstar that's still in their mom's basement who should have made it. There's mm-hmm. always a reason you didn't make it. Mm-hmm. And he, it, if you have all the talent in the world but no drive, you won't make it. If you have all the drive in the world but no talent, you ain't making it. So it's like everything came together. And... um I also think that Prince had constant, I'm, again, I hate people that presuppose what somebody else has going on, but at least from my personal observation, it seemed to me that music was going 24 seven in his head. He was just born that way. And it's like I said, if I went down my basement for 150 years and practiced my guitar, I was I wouldn't even, I'd still be the same as I am today. I couldn't match what Prince does. So there's that, and that magic of that talent, that undefinable creativity, but he did everything to maximize it. And the takeaway is that I believe Prince absolutely knew how talented he was from early on. He had to get there and he had to go through a lot of the bumps and also, but I believe that he truly knew how talented he was. And then he applied that talent in a, I don't want to say 24 seven. I want to say 48, 14. I mean, (laughs) we could be up having played a practical joke when we're living in San Francisco and everybody's laughing and giggling and, you know, doing something like that. And we'd all go to bed with smiles on our faces and Prince would be up all night writing Mm -hmm. and then not even have gone to bed and then wake us all up in the morning and say, let's get into the studio. I just wrote something. Mm -hmm. That's the takeaway that I want everybody to know about is that he worked so hard, turned himself so inside out to give his gift to us. And, and, and to make it happen for us. And, and he really did it and he didn't stop. And, uh, I, I, you know, there's not, not much more I can say, I, you know, when I met him and I said this before, he had the focus and directiveness of a 40 year old CEO of a billion dollar company. When I met him, mm. there was no fooling around here. And so you're given a great talent and he did not waste it. And so that whatever you do in life, whatever you're at focus, put it there. It'll happen. It may, you, you may not become a superstar. You may not, you know, whatever, not everybody's going to be, you know, up there in that where the air is rare, but there's so much that you can accomplish in your lifetime. And he applied his talent to very hard work. And, and he, he had a, a he had an incredible gift that he did not waste it. Mm. So, All right. I don't know if that makes any sense. It's just you asked me off the top of my head, and that's where I'm coming from. Nah, we, we received that. Um, and just, to, you know, the other thing, too, is, you know, as, for as many years as you've been in this business and you've seen it, you know, change and, and, and to be where it is today, do you even think that this business, the music business, can even, uh, I don't know, let's say handle a prince or would even allow a, a, a prince to sort of emerge? Or can there even be another I'll one? I'll tell like you. That? I got to tell you. And I'll make this one comment and I got to get going here pretty quickly. Okay. But um, despite all the conspiracy theories that I've heard about Warner Brothers Records, which is just that, you know, conspiracy theory. Uh, um, what I can tell you is that Warner Brothers, I, I put up a video today on my site, on my, uh, it, it'll be up on my website, but it's certainly up on my Facebook page. It's a video that I did driving around Los Angeles talking about why we chose Warner Brothers Records. I saw that. <laughs> I know it's corny, but I want to. That's no, great. It's great. So, <laughs> so, 
uh, Warner Brothers believed in him. And that day, that's why I wanted to be there. They were artist friendly. They would develop you. They were willing to take a chance on that first album. Now, let me just make one other parenthetical comment to all of this. What if that first album would have sold 20 million? Mm. Think of what would have happened. Most authors, filmmakers, you know, art recording artists that have gigantic, huge albums can never come back and match it. Not because they're less talented, but because of the expectations of them, mm-hmm. you know, Oh man, they, it only sold 8 million, you know? So I, retrospectively, I look back on that first album as necessary. I'm happy it didn't sell 20 million. I think it would have been a, a hard thing, but back to your original question. Warner Brothers gave everything to all the tools to Prince that he needed to get off the ground. In today's day and an age, you know, if you would have gone out and sold 125 or 50,000 albums on your first album, you might get dropped. You probably would get dropped. I got to tell you something. I came out of semi retirement in uh, 2006 or seven. And, uh, I came across, it's in my book. It's this incredible group, seriously talented. And Warner brothers heard that I was doing something. They, they listened to the, the demo of the group and they called me in for a meeting and I'm sitting with the A and R guy. And the guy says, we think your artist is great. Now, can you prove to us that you sold at least 60,000 CDs out of the trunk of your car and you're playing every club west of the Mississippi. Can you prove that? Because that's what we need today. And I looked at the a and guy and I said, are you kidding me? That's the biggest bunch of bullshit I ever heard. If I was selling 60,000 CDs out of the trunk of my car, my act was playing every place west of the Mississippi. Why do I need you? Mm. Your problem is, you want it handed to you on a silver platter. You're not willing to develop it. So your answer is, I don't think that Prince would have had what he got back then today, say, given the same talent. Now, look, obviously he's an incredibly talented guy, so it wasn't like nothing was going to happen to him. But Warner Brothers gave him the opportunity to produce himself, to take a lot, gave all of us, a lot of ability to control, you know, uh, and keep it within us. They listened to us. They signed us. They gave us a three album deal, which even in those days was unheard of. So despite all the conspiracy theories that you hear, which I've seen, which just make me nauseous, to be honest with you. Um, now years later, I know I understood both sides of the problem when Prince wrote Slave on His Face. I understood it, and actually Warner Brothers called me years later. I said, man, I haven't you know, I don't manage the guy, you know, because they were very hurt by that. Mm. But I understood where Prince was coming from, totally. But I understood the, where the record label was coming from. For, for, now, I'm guessing, but I I'm, I'm bet I'm pretty close on this one. Prince, imagine... And your audience imagines you're great painters. You great. You create portraits. You do fabulous portrait painting, and it's beautiful. But you're broke. Okay, you're eating not even peanut butter sandwiches, just the peanut butter. You know, and and I come to see your stuff, and I think it's great. And you say to me, man, if, if you could just give me like twenty five thousand dollars, I wouldn't have to think about a job, or I could just concentrate on my artwork. And I believe in you. And so I give you $25,000 and you become famous. You become a famous painter. But at the end of the day, I own all of your paintings, not you. So I'm just guessing at this point that it was repulsive to Prince that because record labels own your masters that you create, even though you paid them back. So imagine you paid me back, but I still own your paintings. So for Prince at some point where he knew the output of creativity that he was capable of doing, 
that he's turning all of these masters over to Prince, oh, over to Warner Brothers, and they own those masters. And that's a scary, you want to own what you create, right? Mm -hmm. And so for him to turn around and say, well, damn, they own all my masters now. I created all this stuff. I gave it to them. I paid, I paid, paid them back. They've made hundreds of millions of dollars because of me. And I can't even own my own masters. Now you can, after a certain period of time, it's, it's I'm not going to go into it. It's called, um, it's called termination reversion. You have a right to go back in on your, on your publishing and on your masters, but it's a long time. And it was, I understand it now from Warner brothers angle. I understand it too, because that was the business model. That's what everybody did when he signed to the label. That was the business model that everyone accepted. There was no other way to do it. If I were, if I were to start, if I were young enough and I wanted to start a record label again, it would be the kind of record label where you sign with me. You may not get a ton of dough up front. We'll get your stuff out there. But upon sales success, you get to own more and more of your master back hmm. until maybe we each co-own it or you can walk away with it at the, at, at the end of the day. Because that allows artists to own and control their own works, which, you know, I, I get that. I get where Prince was coming from on that. It just so happens he had signed a record deal that where that was what everybody did, whether it was John Lennon, the Beatles, the, you know, James Brown, you know, anybody think about it. That's, that's what it was. So he felt like he was a slave to the man. I understood that. But on the other hand, actually one of the principals who had signed Warner brothers, who was extremely high up in the company called me after that. And he was literally almost had tears in his eyes. I could hear his voice. It's like, God, we gave him everything. Why did he do that? And I said, I'll, I'll make you feel comfortable. Oh, the second part of it was that Prince wanted to put out what he wanted to put out when he wanted to put it out. Right. Because he was so prolific. And the label was saying to him, don't do that. You're going to dilute your audience. You know, even too much chocolate cake will kill you. You know what I'm saying? So if you're putting out an album a month, and I'm exaggerating, if you're putting out an album a month, you're going to dilute your audience. You know, and so they didn't, so he didn't like that kind of control, but I had to make the guy at Warner Brothers feel comfortable because I knew that he had put his life into Prince in the early day. And I said, well, I don't know too many slaves making 10 million a year. Maybe you do, but I don't. So he said, okay, I feel better. He said, but, but still I said, and I explained to him what I'm explaining to you right now. Prince is a much different kind of artist than you're used to. And, and he's going to fight you. Mm. And I understand that Warner brothers still owns all of his masters after he's worked so hard to create them. So I understood the battle at that time. So, uh, and, and, you know, Prince has this legendary vault, right. so he never stopped recording. You know, I worked with artists that have maybe eight songs in their vault, you know? <laughs> and so, uh, uh, he got off the label and then he was able to probably start owning a lot of his stuff after that. So the takeaway from Prince is that, uh, I have a saying there are artists who are flavor of the month, artists who are flavor of the year, artists who come along every 10 years, artists who come along every 20 years. And then there's once every 50 to 60 years, certain artists come along that are that gifted. So you put Miles Davis in there and you put, uh, you know, John Lennon in there and you put Dylan in there. There's, and, you know, and, and, you know, many, many, even Quincy, even, you know, that, that come along, you know, every 50 or 60 years, it's highly unusual. So he's, he's, you know, he's a phenomenon that came along and, and all, and what's great is, you know, there were a lot of people ranking on when Justin Timberlake played his music, you know, during the halftime of the Super Bowl. Right. People were calling me, man, you know, what is he doing? You know, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, look, Justin Timberlake is, is Justin Timberlake is doing his best to keep the legacy and the music alive. Hmm. Prince is not going to be back to play anymore, come up with new stuff. It's a sad, sad thought. 
So we have to honor him. We have to keep his legacy alive. We have to keep his music alive. He must never be forgotten. People are going to be looking back, you know, a hundred years from now as, a, as he's a Mozart, you know, pardon the analogy, but you know what I'm saying? That he's just one of those very rare individuals and we have to keep that legacy and that music alive. Okay. Have I spoken too much? <laughs> no, okay. not, not at all. Not at all. So, <laughs> No, listen, <laughs> Owen, man. You we, can tell how much I believe in him, right? It's oh, not, dude, you, know. you come. This is home. This is the place to do that. <laughs> we could keep going. I'm trying to be respectful of your time. Uh, yeah, I got to get going, actually. But uh, uh, have we been talking for two hours? Oh, my God. Yes, sir. No two, I've been two hours and 20 minutes. And let's just end it out to say, uh, if you haven't already, go out and get Owen's book, Famous People Who've Met Me. Uh, I've read it. Right, it's very entertaining, and it's a it's a it's a, it's one of those journey type books. You're gonna read about a man, and you know you get a a, a great picture of where he came from, uh, and kind of a little bit to where he is now. I think there's still a lot more that can come out of Owen in terms of uh, books and stuff. Hopefully, we'll get like a Minneapolis music sound type of book at some point. But uh, we really appreciate you sharing and coming on with us today Owen. yeah where can people find you online sir uh well online um i have a website called famous people the book.com and if you go on famous people the book.com you, you can see where to buy the book uh, it's right on the page there you know it's amazon apple books uh barnes and noble okay. so you can see right on the home page there but more so than that, this background on me. And then there's a photo page uh, on there where you can uh, go see some of the history photos, what we're doing. And, uh, you know, that's that's pretty pretty much it. Book, I, I can say it's available on Amazon. I was very happy to see under biographies. On, uh, it was like being in the back in the record business again. <laughs> Last Thursday, it hit number one in, in new hot selling, you know, biographies and memoirs yeah. on Amazon. And it was, then I went back like the next day, and it was number two. And I was like, "Oh man, I lost the bullet!" It's like, <laughs> the old, it's like the old charts, you know. <laughs> now I'm watching the charts to see, you know, to, to see. But I'm very flattered. I'm very humbled by all of this, and uh, I just wanted to get a story out there that was not a brag piece that was okay. You're meeting these acts and these artists and prints and everybody through my, through my experience of them, not as, and I, that I told them how to write music or anything like that. It's just, here's my experience. So you're a fly on the wall back in 1976, the first time Prince walks into my house. And that's the way I wanted to write the book. So I hope other people appreciate it. Yeah, definitely. And and I, we're not going to get into it, but but the Yanni story killed me. I was like, damn. <laughs> Woo. Could have had it. That would have been a big one. I'm going to gonna get that cease and desist letter coming every time. <laughs> I was like, so. damn, that would have been a pain day. All right. <laughs> so thank you, guys. I really appreciate it. Thank you, man. We yeah. appreciate you. I want to talk to you. talk to you later. All right. Thank you. And bye, Sacramento. <laughs> <laughs> Take it easy, Owen. Later. Bye. All right. Ladies and gentlemen, that was a good one. Uh, Big Sexy, you still there with me? I'm still there with you. All right. Well, man, uh, before we get out of here, because I'm going to immediately release this episode so it's to be timely what I say here. If you are going to Minneapolis this next coming week here, because this is being recorded on... Uh, April 14th, and celebration is next week. Please, if you can, come to our meet and greet uh, at the People's Organic. It's uh, April 19th at 11 to 3 p.m. And uh, it's just going to be a good time. Uh, a lot of people are going to be coming through. And we're just going to be there, you know, to, to have something to eat and sit down and meet with each other, say what's up, take pictures, uh, and just chill out. So it's going to be a, a, a lot of people there. Um uh, Scotty Baldwin, uh, Jackie Thompson, Dwayne Tudal, uh, Kim Berry, uh, Dave Hampton, uh, Sasha Lang, I believe Chaz is coming through, and a couple other people I'll just leave as surprises, but it's going to be a lot of fun, so please check us out there. 
uh, Big Sexy, man. Any last words before we get out of here? Uh, yeah, people coming from the West Coast who are heading out to Celebration, bundle up. <laughs> it is snowing out there. Yeah. Be yeah. prepared. Oh, that's going to be good. I don't care if it's snow. Let it snow. Let it snow. As long as the flights don't get delayed, everything should be good. Um, but yeah, definitely dress warm. But with that, oh, and a special shout out to all my Patreon listeners. I hope you enjoyed your packages. They should have already arrived or they're arriving as we speak. So definitely enjoy that. And it's just, again, a thank you to you guys for all your support. And we got more stuff coming. Uh, We out of here. Working like a job. My name is Michael Dean. We'll see you next time. Peace.